do without you. <laughs> okay, um, let's stand for um, the text. We're reading from Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 1 through 6. <clears throat> Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel, against the shepherds who feed my people, you have scattered my flock, driven them away, and not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for the evil of your doings, says the Lord. But I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries where I have driven them, and bring them back to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper, and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that they shall no longer say, as the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives who brought up, who brought up and led the descendants of the house of Israel from the north country and from all the countries where I had driven them, and they shall dwell safely in their own land. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a wonderful prophecy of the regathering of your people. Lord, I pray that you would bless it to our hearts today and that we might rejoice in the expectation that we have in you. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. You can be seated. Well, first of all, a happy Thanksgiving to all of you. I hope you have a wonderful time, good time with family and those that you are going to spend Thanksgiving with then. And then you can truly rejoice and be thankful from your heart for the blessings of this year that God has given you. And one of the most wonderful blessings, of course, is the message of salvation and what God has planned for his people. Uh, next Sunday is the first Sunday of Advent. It's a special Sunday. It's the beginning of the church year, and we will start the next um, year of Scripture um, on Sunday. It's also the anniversary of Gwen's memorial. I always have, I'll always remember that, I think, as long as I live, that, that Gwen's memorial was on the first Sunday of Advent, because it was such an important time for her. So we'll have the Advent candles next Sunday, and think of it as a time of beginnings, but the scripture today is about the reign of Christ. And in a sense, it's looking at something in the future that we all look forward to. And I hope that just sharing some thoughts about this today will help us to really rejoice over this Thanksgiving time and that it could hold a high priority in our Thanksgiving celebration. What we have to look forward to. The Apostle Paul said that if we don't have a future then we are of all people to be pitied. David, King David, looked around him and said, why is it that we who trust in God are always in trouble? You know, it's like we are singled out for trouble. And all around us, when people are wicked, they just, they don't have any trouble at all. But then he said he considered their end. And he was instructed by it. And so that's sort of what we're looking at today, the end of the church year. What's ahead for us? What are we looking forward to? And, and what does God have in store for us? Because there is a future. You know, when um, God said, I think it's in Jeremiah, that I know the plans I have for you, that you have a future and a hope. Surely this is one aspect of that, and maybe the most important aspect, that we have a future and a hope, not just in this world, but in the world to come. The uh, rule and reign of Christ and the gathering of his people is prophesied throughout Scripture. In fact, in the book of Jude, one of the last books in the Bible, the brother of Christ, Jude, writes about this end-time event 
and said that all the prophets from the beginning have spoken of this. And it said even Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about it. He writes Enoch's prophecy in, his, in the book of Jude. So it's like all throughout the Old Testament and through the history of God's people, there's been this theme running that God is going to set up a kingdom and it's going to be right. Everything in it is going to be right. It's going to be perfect because the goodness of God will be its measure. It's like that's what's going to determine everything is the goodness that comes out of the heart of God. Everything is going to be good. It's going to be right and there won't be any more evil or sin. All of that is going to be dealt with and done away with. And also, one of the ways that God hides these things from the wise and the prudent and reveals them to babes is because they are mixed in with other things that are happening meanwhile, and there are many partial fulfillments that take place. Like God delivering the children of Israel out of Egypt and bringing them into the land of promise and establishing them in a kingdom is a like a partial fulfillment of these prophecies. It's like God's people being brought out and established and they have their own country, they have their own kingdom and God's blessing is on them. And So that's a fulfillment. And then the return of Israel out of Babylon is another one. When God brings them back and, and it's also, again, a partial fulfillment. The, the Bible calls these things types and shadows. They are like symbols in a sense. They are real, but they are symbolic. They are symbolic of this great judgment that's coming when evil is going to be banished and God's people are going to be gathered together and brought together. Uh, there are many prophecies in Scripture that, that are not easy to understand. And frankly, I, I have sort of stayed away from them because they, there is so much controversy about how all this is going to come down. You know, you have um, so many different ideas and opinions, and, and some of them are diametrically opposed to one another. You know, and, and um, why? I mean, why even? It's almost like Satan has done this on purpose to keep us from thinking about end times or to make it so confusing that we don't know what to think when we do think about it. When it should be one of our most strong hopes, you know, it should be something that motivates us, something that affects the way we live, because we are looking forward to something that's absolutely sure. It's been prophesied over and over again. It's going to come. God is going to judge the earth, and he's going to establish us in his kingdom. And so no wonder the thief on the cross looked at Jesus and said, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. I want to say that to him too. When you come into your kingdom, remember me, you know? Because um, I want to be part of that. And we have this promise of the king seated and reigning and ruling. And here in our scripture today, he is dying on the cross. I mean, what a seeming contradiction. But you see, our king wins us. He wins his subjects, not by killing them or killing people, but by dying for them, by dying in their place, taking their punishment upon himself, suffering for them. So he wins our hearts by giving himself for us and by ministering to us uh, throughout our lives uh, the good things of the gospel and the good things that of his kingdom. But there are many prophecies, like Amos chapter 9, verse 8 says, Behold, the eyes of the Lord are on the sinful kingdom. That's the northern ten tribes he's talking about. He says, I will destroy them from the face of the earth, for surely I will command, and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations as a grain is sifted in a sieve, and yet not the smallest grain shall fall to the ground. And we know that that prophecy came true. The northern ten tribes disappeared. And it's been a mystery ever since where they are. And, and people show up in different places. One group, one people group showed up in China. 
And they look Chinese, totally Hebrew, you know. So they assume, people assume that's one of the ten tribes maybe. But, um, but where are they? You know, the ten tribes are, have disappeared. And we have many prophecies about God bringing them back. Like um, there is one in Hosea. Um, I'll just read a few of these. <clears throat> Hosea chapter 11 verse 8 just the anguished cry of God's heart about the northern kingdom and the northern kingdom in the scripture is often called Ephraim because Ephraim was the leading tribe remember that Manasseh and Ephraim were the two sons of Joseph and when Jacob the father of Joseph blessed them in his final blessing he put his right hand on Ephraim, who was the younger one, and his left hand on Manasseh, who was the older. And Joseph tried to switch him. He said, no, no. And he blessed Ephraim and gave him sort of like the birthright blessing. And uh, so the ten tribes are often called Ephraim because he, that was the main tribe. And so this is God talking to the northern tribes. And he says, northern ten tribes, how can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I make set you like Zeboam? These are cities that God destroyed. My heart churns within me. My sympathy is stirred. I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am the Lord, I am God and not man, the Holy One in your midst. And um, it goes on. This is just how God feels about it. It's like, but you know, the children of Israel in the Bible are, in a sense, symbolic of all mankind. God cares about people. He doesn't want to judge and destroy us. He wants us to repent. He wants us to turn to him, to come to him, to um, begin to seek him. To think about him and see him. He wants us to have faith. And he's, of course, made this possible through Christ. But um, I, won't, uh, I won't read a lot of scripture today. Uh, there's just a few of us here, so we can shorten things up. But, um, but in the scripture, there are many, many prophecies of how God would look for them. One of them is in Jeremiah 16. It says that I'm going to send um, many fishermen. And they're going to fish my people out of all the places where I've driven them, where all the places I've sent them. Doesn't that sort of coincide with what Jesus said to Peter when he, was, when he called him, Peter and Andrew? They were casting their nets and Jesus came and said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So they left their nets, left everything, and followed Christ and became fishers of men. Are these some of the fishers that God sent? Is God still sending fishers to, to seek his people? Are we one of those fishers that can go out? And, and he said afterward, he said, I'm going to send hunters, and they're going to hunt them. Hunt them out of the caves and every place where they are is going to hunt them. So God is looking for people. Do you realize that God is looking for you? He's looking for people. He has people hunting. He sends them out and fishers. On the, when you read about the river of life in Ezekiel, it says on the, the river is teeming with fish. And on the banks of the river, there are fishermen who are at work. They're working their nets and bringing in the fish out of the river of life. So God is looking for people. And he wants people. He wants each one of us. And he wants us for that eternal kingdom. That's his highest priority. That's why you were born. That's why you're here today. It's because he wants you in his kingdom. That's God's priority. And that's what he wants for you. We, um, in this passage that we have today, it says he's going to make a covenant of peace with them. The way he does this, of course, is through the Lord Jesus Christ. He made peace through the blood of his cross. He made everybody one. The, uh, he says he made both one. That is, 
Old and New Testament believers, I believe, and, and Gentiles and Jews made them all into one body. So there's one body, and um, we all become one people through the blood of his cross. He grants repentance and a covenant of peace. And this is the simple message that the apostles taught from the days of Jesus on, was that it's necessary to repent. It's necessary to turn from our sins and to have faith in the salvation that God has provided. Turn from your sin and put your faith in God. You can't make yourself better, but you can repent from your sin and put your faith in God and what he has done, what he has provided. You know, Christianity is so much more about what God has done than about what we have done or what we are doing or about what God is doing rather than what we are doing. And um, he has provided so much for us to enter into. It's like it is limitless and we, can, we are always growing and always entering into more and more of what God has, has provided for us. So that simple message, repentance and faith. Trust God. Repent of your sin and trust God. Just trust him. No matter what's going on, what you're facing, how things look, just trust him. Trust him. He is trustworthy. And whether we trust him or not really says so much about what we really believe about him. You know, it's like if we can't trust him, why not? It's because we believe something that um, keeps us from it. But trust him. Repentance and faith. Christ's um, work in the world, his healings, his casting out of demons, um, these are just like the beginnings. These are like the first fruits of Christ's rule. It's showing his power. It's showing his authority. But it's not really the full meal deal yet. It's just the beginning of it. It's not, um, there is much more to come. Um, Jesus in his parables often spoke about this, that um, like the parable of the vine dressers. He said that the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, this is the rule of Christ, is like a man who had a vineyard and leased it out to like tenants and they took care of the vines. And uh, so when it was time for fruit, he sent some of his servants to receive some of the fruit and they mistreated them. They wouldn't give the owner of the vineyard the fruit that he was looking for. And so um, time went on, he sent more and he sent more and finally he sent his own son. He said, surely they'll reverence my son. But instead of that, they cast him out of the vineyard and kill him. And this is one of the parables of Jesus. He said, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He's, and they said, they, they said, well, he'll cast them out and put other people in who will, put, who will give him the fruit. And Jesus said, yeah, that's, that's how it is. You know, God is looking for people who will return to him uh, the, what he's looking for, which is simply... Uh, worship and fellowship and and uh, someone who will receive the things that he wants to give with gratitude and and praise. I think there are two common mistakes that we generally make when it comes to the reign of Christ, the rule of Christ. One is that there is no rule now, that Jesus is not right now ruling, because we see all the things that are wrong. We see things that happen that uh, no way come from him. You know, that you would never ascribe to Christ. But, um, so we say, well, must be he's not ruling right now. But, um, but Jesus is ruling now. He is ruling and reigning. The scripture makes it very clear. He's seated at the right hand of power. And in fact, the most often quoted prophecy out of the Old Testament that I know about is the one where it says that the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And Paul says that he must be seated there until all of his enemies are made his footstool. So that's happening right now. But Jesus is the benevolent ruler of his people. He is ruling in his kingdom. Those who have entered into the kingdom of God and are part of his kingdom, he is ruling over them and he's doing it 
because they are totally voluntary. We place ourselves under his rule. We allow him to have his way with us. His mind is our law. We have the mind of Christ, and that is how we live. The mind of Christ is not only our law, it's our life. You know, it's like we, in him we live and move and have our being. He is our king and our God, so he is ruling over us. But uh, he is a benevolent ruler. He, is, he has our good in his heart. You know, one of the ways that um, I think about, one of the things I think about when I think about Jesus being the king and us serving him is what Paul, the words that Paul used in, I think it's 1 Corinthians 7, when he talked about undistracted devotion. I mean, what a challenge that is to me. I don't know about you, but that's the biggest challenge I face is distractions. You know, it's like I can go for a whole day and not even think about the fact that God is anywhere around or that he has anything to do with me. You know, just distracted. But undistracted where, it, where, even, uh, where we can be aware of the presence of God and, and grateful and receiving his blessing uh, throughout the day because we are um, living in that. The other um, common mistake that we make when we think about the reign of Christ is that we, we somehow feel like there's no future rule, you know, that um, um, we forget about the perfect kingdom that is to come. But I'd like to say just a few things about the present rule. Uh, if Jesus is really ruling and reigning in our lives, then there is a capitulation to the mind and will of God with our whole heart. No holding back. You know, it's like total surrender. It's giving ourselves to God and giving everything to God, giving our, all that we owe, own and uh, all that we owe, yes, and everything. It's all his, you know. We give ourselves to God. And the reason we can do that is because we know that he is not a harsh taskmaster. You know, that's one of the mistaken ideas that people have about God. In one of the parables of Jesus, he brought that out in the parable of the talents. This person thought that God was a harsh taskmaster. And, um, and that was his judgment. You know, that's what he thought. And so God judged him that way. But to believe that my good is in the heart of God. You know, he has my good in his heart. Whatever he even allows to come my way, he can turn it for the good. Because my good is in his heart. And we also have to remember that everyone's good is in his heart. You know? He loves everybody. Whatever he does, he does for the good of, of mankind. And that I can trust him. Also, when you think about the present rule, that's one aspect of it. Another one is that, that his rod, you know, often a, a rod is symbolic. I mean, uh, Moses had his rod, but kings had theirs too, their staff or their scepter or whatever you want to call it. And um, the rod of God is his word. And a number of places it's called a rod of iron. Why would he call it that? It's because it's unbending, you know? It's unchanging. It's abiding. It's sure. Absolutely certain. Every word is going to come to pass. So when God talks about judgment, one day there's going to be a full and final judgment. You know? Everything that he says is going to be absolutely true. And it's the rod of God. When he talks about ruling over the nation, he says he's going to rule them with a rod of iron. So that word of God is going to come down on the nations and they're going to be judged by it. You know? Right now, people can do sort of what they want. Free will, you know, they, they do what they want. But the day is coming when God's word is going to come down and it's going to judge. Everybody will be judged by it. Also, the, in Revelation, talks about the rod of his mouth. See, it's, it's really, there's no doubt about what it is. It's God's word. It's God's speaking, things he has spoken. Also, Hebrews 4.12 tells us like a sharp sword. Revelation also speaks about the sword coming out of his mouth. 
So one day, the judgments of the word are going to be fully executed. So to summarize briefly, we serve a king who captures his subjects, not by killing them, but by dying in their place, dying for them. And because of the fact that Jesus did that, the Bible says that God exalted him to the very highest place that anyone could be exalted to, given him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord, is king. He is the ruler. He is the one the Bible prophesied about. And... Um, and he's the one that every knee will bow to. So God exalted him from the cross to the throne. Um, the, if you want to get a good picture of what this means, read the book of Acts. Because it's reiterated over and over again. As the apostles went out speaking first to the Jewish people and then to the world about the exaltation of Christ. In um, Acts chapter 3, for example, says, You killed the prince of life. The original word there is the originator of life. You killed the one who was life himself. You killed the one who, on, on whom you depend for life. And um, also, you know, there's, there's many others like that. Acts chapter 2 speaks about him being exalted to David's throne and so on. <clears throat> when I was thinking about this, I asked myself these questions. Are the problems of America the ungodly, God-denying people who don't know him? Or is it the falling away of Christians? Are we being won by the world rather than winning the world? Are we being lulled to sleep? Um, are we even in bed with the enemy? Are we given over to the idolatry of the culture? Are we chasing their gods? And then asking, where is the rule of Christ? I think the bigger question and the most important question, the one that I have posed to myself in this, is has God put all his enemies within me under his feet? You know, that's really the big question. Has God put all of his enemies within me under his feet? Or is, is there still more of me to conquer? Is there anything in me that resists his will? I have the mind of Christ... If that's true, then his mind will conquer all as I trust and worship. And as I submit to him in faith and hope and love. And the greatest, of course, is love. So what a, what a salvation we have, you know? What a future. I mean, we have a strong hope, the scripture says, who have fled to the Lord for a refuge. And at the close of the church year, what an appropriate scripture to look at. What we have in store at the closing day. Because just as the church year rolls around and every year you have the last day of the church year, one day there's going to be the last day of our life. And one day is going to be the last day of this world. It's going to come, absolutely. Absolutely. And we have a future and a hope, you know? We have something to look forward to that is beyond imagination, beyond comprehension. We have no point of reference hardly to, to compare it with, you know? God is going to, Jesus said that for those who are called and chosen and brought into his kingdom, he's going to have them sit down and he's going to serve them. You know, what does that mean? I, I don't know. I, I, maybe it will be a meal, but 
I'm sure it's a lot more than that, you know? It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And God wants us to rejoice in it. Uh, he wants us to be able to rejoice in it when things look the worst, you know? When it looks like everything's totally out of control, like all hope is gone, you know? He wants us to be able to look forward and say, we have a hope, you know? <laughs> We can, um, this is nothing. We've got something to look forward to that makes it all worthwhile. So what a, what a um, note to close on. Isn't that a note to close on? That's what I want to close on when I get to the end of my life. And on that day, on that last day, that's where I want to be. Faith in the only one who can save us. Because he made us, he made it all. And he has the power to save us. Let's stand for prayer. We'll have prayer and the benediction and we'll be dismissed. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, as our as we come to this Thanksgiving week, thank you that we live in a country that still honors that day set so long ago by the pilgrims. Thank you, Lord, that you made a place, that you had a place for those at that time who needed freedom of worship. Lord, we're grateful for this past several hundred years of history, that we still enjoy that freedom. I pray that it will continue until the end of time. But Lord, this morning we pray that this week would be a, day, a week of special celebration as we think about the end of time, the end of the church year, the end of our life, and the end of time. God, I pray that it could be faced with joyful celebration. Lord, make our faith strong. Cleanse our hearts from anything that would hold us back or would dilute us. Lord, I pray for purity of heart for each one of us. That we could um, experience fellowship with you in a, in a measure that would be life transforming, life changing. That the past really could be the past and the future would be all glory. Bless us to this end, I pray in Jesus' name.